on how we understand microbiomes, because we're going through a period when technical advances are really beginning to overturn our ideas of microbial communities. And crucially, from my perspective as an evolutionary microbiologist, I'm interested in kind of what has agency in microbial communities? What are the entities which are evolving and how can we understand them? Okay, so the microscope was invented about 350 years ago. This is one of the microscopes like Leeuwenhoek used to reveal microscopic communities for the first time. And one, this is a quote about uh, Leeuwenhoek here, so very few could follow Leeuwenhoek, mainly because of the technical state of the instrument and sheer lack of understanding in others, because microscopy takes the human consciousness into an entirely new world as with a newborn child. And I really read this through the lens of microbiology, because I feel like microbiology really does take us into this new and exciting and alien world. And one of the exciting things, of course, about living now is that we can get microscopes really easily. We can use these to look at the microscopic world and really bring this world to life. So what do we see if we get a microscope and we look down at what, is, what did Leeuwenhoek see when he looked at his microscope? Well, he saw a world that looked a bit like this, or at least is represented like this. And it was represented like this because first of all, uh, it's shocking. So this woman here is looking down a microscope, looking at this microbial world and is so shocked she's dropping her tea, perhaps also because she realized that these are the sorts of microbes which were living in the water used to make her tea. But of course, this is a, an, an illustration and it's been drawn with artistic license. And if you look at some of these microbes in this illustration, many of them look like animals. And indeed, this idea of thinking about the world, microscopic world as being a world full of little animals um, was really embodied by um, Leeuwenhoek's work, right? He called these microbe diachens. I, probably horribly mispronouncing that, sorry to any Dutch speakers, but the rough translation of this is little animals. And it was Oldenburg's translation, which gave us the word animacule. So glass lenses were giving us a window into the microscopic world and our macrocosm of animals and plants provided a sort of metaphorical lens to understand this alien microscopic world. And the consequence of this is that we've been really inclined to see microbiomes as collections of individuals. And we've been inclined to see them as collections of individuals which are kind of a bit like little animals, right? We name microbial species in the same way that we name animal species. And I kind of think this is quite interesting because, you know, this is an example of how our, our you know, how our social, you know, what, what we understand about the world is in sort of being imposed almost onto this other world. And it made me kind of wonder, you know, is this really the way that the microbial world is, right? And the reason I was thinking about this is because the genome revolution has really overturned, or at least is really beginning to challenge the idea of a microbial world consisting of these little individual species, right? So what would our conception of microbiology look like now if Leeuwenhoek had invented the genome sequencer instead? You know, we'd be going out and we'd be looking at these collections of genes. We'd perhaps be looking at pan genomes in the same way that James McInerney was talking to us about a couple of days ago and seeing pan genomes and seeing them as the sort of unit that we needed to understand rather than these microbial individuals. I think we have a different idea of agency, different idea of individuality. We'd maybe use different metaphors to talk about the microbial world. So this is a kind of, I think, the kind of um, culture clash, I suppose, or the kind of revolution we're seeing uh, 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 and the way of understanding microbial communities we're undergoing at the moment. And this is because, of course, you know, we look inside our microbial communities, we see these, you know, we call them microbial individuals. But the, the, the important thing is that they are evolving quickly and they're evolving quickly by horizontal gene transfer. And this is really an understanding of the microbial world that was only really available to us with genome sequencing to understand the, 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 the true extent of horizontal gene transfer. And it's really quite astonishing. So for example, bacillus is gaining and losing genes at four times the rate of mutation. Pseudomonas, it's four orders of magnitude higher than that. And this means that thousands of genes are being gained and lost in the time taken for just 1% amino acid divergence. So this fact that horizontal gene transfer is making this really important contribution to microbial evolution. And the fact that we're really starting to understand the microbiomes more and more by sequencing rather than just picking out strains and seeing what those individual microbes are, mean that we really need to start thinking about mobile genetic elements, not as properties or traits of the microbes that carry them, but as integral constituents of microbial communities. Okay, so yeah, mobile genetic elements. <laughs> 
So this is my kind of <laughs> thought introduction. I hope uh, I hope you're all okay with it. Um, so I was really taken by the title for this um, conference series. I think it's a really nice title. This idea of, of uh, plasmids as vehicles for antimicrobial resistance spread. And of course, vehicle is another metaphor, right? We can sort of think about vehicles in lots of different ways or lots of different kinds of vehicles. This is another metaphor that we're taking from our world of trains and cars, and we're sort of using it to try and understand this alien and essentially unknowable world uh, of, of the microbiome. Uh, but I'm sort of using this as a little bit of way of framing my talk today. So uh, I'm going to talk about three different kinds of vehicles <laughs> that we can sort of think about plasmids as being. We're going to talk about delivery vans, I'm going to talk about party bus, and I'm going to talk about taxi cabs. Okay. Right, so um, I want to understand plasmids and microbiomes. Plasmids, I mean, I don't even know why I bother with this slide because you all know this stuff already, right? They're these quintessential mobile genetic elements. And the key thing is that they're these Darwinian entities. This has been covered already. I'm sorry for putting this slide in. Um, what I'm going to say is that today on my talk, I'm going to focus on three key ecological mechanisms which cast light on this kind of world of plasmids and microbial communities. And these are ecological mechanisms. I will be talking about molecular mechanisms as well. I'm saying this because ecological mechanisms are just as much important to understand as the molecular mechanism when we're trying to understand microbiology. It's important to understand ecological mechanisms as well. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about selection. So when environmental conditions favor plasmids, then I'm gonna talk about infectious transfer, which is when the plasmid is in control. And finally, I'm gonna be talking about compensatory evolution. Okay, so this is the model system that I've done this work with. Um, it's a set of large, mercury resistance plasmids which came from the exact same habitat as the bacterium that I work with Pseudomonas fluorescent SPW25. So when we took these, when we take these plasmids and we put them in this bacterial host, this is a kind of uh, a new pairing that we've not seen already in nature, but it's one that is very realistic because we know that these organisms are sympatric. Okay, so selection. To understand how selection affects plasmid carriage, what we can do is we can take these plasmids, we can put them in a test strain, and we can do what we call competition assays, where we do a head-to-head -head competition between plasmid-free, plasmid-containing strains, and measure the relative fitness. And what we can find when we do these kinds of experiments is we see that plasmids have a fitness cost, right? I would definitely not the first person to find this. All throughout plasmid biology, we, we see plasmids have fitness costs. And, uh, one, the conception of plasmids is sort of like this adaptation module, providing these key adaptive genes. And indeed, we can kind of see that with mercury resistance plasmids, because although they have a fitness cost when there's no mercury around, we can add mercury to the environment, and then these plasmids become beneficial. So we can see these costs of plasmids becoming outweighed by selection. And so we might sort of think of plasmids through this light as being like a toolkit or like I say, like a delivery van, right? The bacterium sitting there, it needs some new kind of trait. The plasmid is a vehicle that delivers it to, 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 to those individuals. But I'm gonna try and convince you that this isn't the case. And the reason why is that we know that plasmid dynamics vary even when plasmids are beneficial. So this is an experiment done by Anastasia Katara that um, I, I helped with a little bit, but it's really Anastasia's experiment. What she did was she took the same uh, mercury resistance plasmid, put it into these five different species of Pseudomonas, and then basically asked, do these species maintain the plasmid? And what she found was when there's no selection for the plasmid, we see this really clear pattern where two of the species maintain the plasmid really well, right? So it's quite, um, you know, quite remarkable that they're actually maintaining the plasmid, even though we know it's costly. And then these other three species lose it quite quickly, right? But this is when there's no selection for the plasmid. What happens when the plasmid is beneficial? Well, confusingly, it's kind of the same thing. So even when we've got selection for the plasmid, in the short term, perhaps, it means the plasmid is maintained, but in the long term, the plasmid gets lost. And this is because of transposition of the mercury resistance genes from the plasmid onto the chromosome. So this tells us that selection isn't the whole story. We can't think of plasmids just as these delivery vans. Plasmids aren't just persisting because they're useful. Okay, so just there's a more nuanced interaction. Okay, next we wanted to understand what happens in the context of a multi-species microbiome, right? So this was just a single species. What happens when we've got plasmid favorable species occurring alongside unfavorable ones? So this is, this is like 25,000 PCR reactions in like one, one figure. So what I'm, what I'm showing here is 
six uh, independent replicas where we're looking at single species cultures of Pseudomonas fluorescens, which if you recall from the previous slide is one that likes to maintain plasmids, and Pseudomonas putida, which is one that tends not to maintain the plasmid. This is on the left panels, we're seeing what happens when there's no mercury around, right panels with mercury, time on the x-axis, plasmid frequency on the y-axis. What we can see is again, Pseudomonas fluorescens maintains this plasmid regardless of whether we've got selection or not. Pseudomonas putida gets rid of it, regardless of whether we have selection or not. But when we co-culture these two species together in the context of a microbiome, we actually see the maintenance of this plasmid in Pseudomonas putida, so in the unfavorable host, and we see the same pattern happening in the presence of mercury as well. So what this tells us is that infectious transfer can maintain a plasmid. So this is uh, a plasmid being able to be maintained in a sort of source species or a reservoir species, and then that's kind of spilling out to other members of the community. And this suggests the importance of understanding plasmids in their own right as these entities which can infect and move and Darwinian entities, you know, they can be successful by infection. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case of a beneficial. And actually, this property of infectious plasmid transfer has really interesting consequences for non-plasmid genes, because when we sequence clones from this experiment, we actually saw a lot of unexpected gene mobilization. Now, this is a bit of a complicated figure, and I'm really keen not to overgo my time. So really what I want you to understand here is that the semicircle on the left shows the genomes from Pseudomonas putida, the, geno the semicircles on the right show genomes from Pseudomonas fluorescens, and these little triangles and the arrows between them show where genes have moved over the course of the experiment. And what we can see are chromosomal genes in both of these species, so the chromosomal genes are on the top half of the diagram, moving onto these plasmids, moving between species, and then in some cases jumping off the plasmid on the other side when they've sort of reached their destination. And these are quite big um, regions of the genome. So for example, this transposed on TN6291 is about 22 KB. They've got a large number of what we call accessory genes in them as well. Basically what we can see here are these you know, transposons with the potential to carry diverse functions being picked up and carried around by the plasmids. So this is my next vehicle metaphor. It's a bit like a bus. Um, but then of course a bus doesn't quite work because um, in, in this metaphor, the plasmid is actually moving around, getting the genes that it wants and assembling them potentially and helping to spread antimicrobial resistance that way. One thing we have in Liverpool are these kind of party buses um, and so this is where people get in this and they drive around and they pick up all of their friends, they have a great time all together. And perhaps this is another kind of vehicle metaphor for trying to understand plasmids as these entities which they've got their agency and they're moving around picking up the genes that they need in order to increase their own fitness and, 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 and endow that on, the, on, on their host as they're moving around. But again, I don't think this is the whole picture. I think we need another metaphor on top of this. And this comes from this phenomenon that um, the plasmids are costly, right? I showed you some of this data before. We've heard about this again uh, today in some of the talks earlier. And there are lots of different mechanisms by which plasmids might be costly, right? Dave Baltrus uh, wrote about this really clearly uh, almost 10 years ago now, and an updated paper by Sa um, Alvaro and, and Craig, um, more recently focusing on plasmids, this phenomenon of like, you know, what causes plasmid fitness costs? And we can have lots of hypotheses about how this might happen. You know, the fact that there's more DNA, there's more gene expression, there are various toxic genes, there are various potential negative interactions. But what we do know about plasmid fitness costs is that they can be resolved, right? And again, we've seen a lot of this, right? Alvaro and Craig, uh, Ben Kerr and uh, Hannah George. Uh, we've seen this in E. coli as well, and Pseudomonas, and with big plasmids and with small plasmids, um, and lots of different kinds of genes involved. And so these compensatory mutations can reduce plasmid fitness costs, and we see that happening in our system as well. So our evolution experiments have shown three key targets, which seem like they're sort of evolving in parallel. So what I mean is, when we do an evolution experiment, plasmid-containing treatments tend to have these mutations, plasmid-free treatments don't. So the key targets which tend to be hit uh, in our particular bacterium with a plasmid that we've worked on are the GAC-AS system, which is the Global Regulator of Secondary Metabolism. I'm not going to focus on this much today. There's a great paper by Ellie. You can read um, if you want to know more about that. We also have this gene of unknown structure and function, which was repeatedly mutated in different plasmid evolution experiments. We call it PFLU4242. As you probably can guess by the name, we don't really know what this gene is doing yet. And then there's a gene which is present on the plasmid, which also was repeatedly mutated in about 25% of our evolved populations, and this is a putative lambda repressor gene. So 
Uh, this was published in PLOS Biology. You can read it more if I'm going through all this too, too quickly. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep the time. Um, so we can do experiments which can show that disruption to these genes ameliorates plasmid fitness cost. So if we knock out GACS or we knock out PFLU4242, there's no plasmids around, we have no fitness cost. If there is a plasmid around in the wild type background with PQ157, you've got 17% fitness cost. But then mutating either of these genes resolves this fitness cost. And this is even more extreme with PQBR 103 is like a 50% fitness cost with the plasmid. And then we just delete one gene, right? We delete GACS or we delete PFLU 4242 and that fitness cost is resolved. And so this also tells us that the same mutations can ameliorate different plasmids as well. We can also find the plasmid mutation ameliorating plasmid fitness costs. So this is for context, right? This is a 30, sorry, a 300 KB plasmid, right? 300 KB plasmid, a single base pair mutation. And so what we can see here is that with the ancestral plasmid, we again have a 70% fitness cost, a single base pair mutation effectively resolves that fitness cost. So compensatory evolution is important. And the fact that compensatory evolution could happen so effectively shows us that the costs, the main costs of plasmid doesn't come from having more DNA because they're still maintaining these plasmids. They just don't have the same cost. It doesn't come from gene expression. And I've sort of skipped over a little bit with that. I've got RNA seq data, which shows us. Don't have time for it in this talk. And it also suggests that it's not toxic products either, because what we can see again is that uh, you know conjugation rates remain the same in these compensated strains, and it's, it's very specific genes which are getting affected. And so this leaves us with the fact that it's, it's inter potential interactions either with other mobile genetic elements or with chromosomes uh, in, in the cell. So to understand what was kind of going on here, we did an RNA seq experiment. So in this diagram, each column is a different gene, which has been differentially expressed following acquisition of the wild type strain with either of these plasmids. So this is telling us what happens when these bacteria gain the plasmid. And we can see a large number of genes which are upregulated following acquisition of both plasmids. And it turns out that most of these are involved or associated with the SOS response and with signal transduction. And if we go into them in a bit more detail, we can see that almost all of them are associated with predicted chromosomal mobile genetic elements. Now I've done a bit more work on this. I don't have time to talk about it because I wanna talk about what happens with compensation. So what happens with compensation? So we see when the bacteria gain these plasmids, we've got this massive gene differential expression. If we get these mutations, the mutation by itself actually has no effect on gene expression at all. And this mutation in the context of the other plasmid brings down almost all of those differentially expressed genes. And the same is true for that single plasmid mutation. All of these differentially expressed genes, which were causing mischief in the wild type strain, have come back down to being non-significant here. Okay, but there are some genes which remain upregulated, and what are these? Turns out that these actually encode the transposase for that transpose, a chromosomal transposon that we saw jumping between the two different species a few slides before. So what this is telling us is that this transposon on the chromosome knows when the plasmid is here, even when the plasmid isn't causing all of this disruption. And this really makes sense from the perspective of the transposon, because a transposon obviously can't move between cells by itself. It needs other mobile genetic elements like plasmids. And a plasmid arriving is really great you know, opportunity for this mobile genetic element to start transposing, moving onto the plasmid, and then giving it the ability to use that plasmid as a vehicle for horizontal gene transfer to move into new backgrounds. So this is the plasmid uh, as a taxi cab, and this signal that the mobile genetic element is getting that, that causes it to upregulate its transposon is almost like the ping uh, on the phone, which tells it this, this cab has arrived. Okay, so these are my summaries. Selection for plasmid encoded traits is not enough. Infectious transfer is important. Compensation is important. And we really need to start thinking about mobile genetic elements in their own right, not as just these traits or not as just like you know, extra features in a microbiome or in a pangenome. They're actually entities with their own fitness interests and evolve as such. Okay, so um, this is my research group as it stands. I'm in Liverpool. We've got a bunch of projects which are kind of ongoing and, and, and um, you know, some really great students, postdocs working on this at the moment. Uh, we'll probably be recruiting more people soon. So if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, uh, please get in touch. Um, these are my kind of key collaborators uh, in Manchester, Sheffield, York and Liverpool who've been involved in this work or involved in the associated discussions. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. This is my kind of concluding slide. Thank you very much, James. Uh...
Sorry, Time that for, was all uh, a bit. One or two <laughs> questions. Uh, why don't I read out? Jana's got a question in the um, in the chat. Uh, Jamie, if you find that the same compensatory mutations vary repeatedly and quite drastically ameliorate fitness cost, why do you think the plasmids maintain these genes in the first place? Why aren't they selected against? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, of course, there are compensatory mutations that occur in the plasmids and compensatory mutations which occur in the chromosome. And it's, it's, it's going to be because there's come some kind of pleiotropic effect. Right, the, the fact that we see these genes. So for example, it may be that the chromosomal genes are beneficial under certain kinds of environments. And so breaking them has these negative effects in those certain environments. And it looks like it's maybe the same with the plasmids as well. So um, I just, it's a bit long winded in explanation. I can go into it in a bit more detail if we've got a chance in the discussion, but essentially the plasmid mutation has an in, causes an increased fitness cost in the presence of other plasmids. That will, that's what we suspect is going on. So compensation for this particular plasmid is it's good and accessible when it's by itself, but when it's in the multi-plasmid context, it's got a problem. And so that could be why uh, this, this gene exists um, in, in, in these natural isolates. Connie has a question as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk a lot. Uh... <laughs> was fantastic. Um, I just want to learn from you that you have thoughts about how to determine fitness costs under the conditions, for instance, of the sugar beet rhizosphere, because the fascinating thing of these plasmids is that they originate from the rhizosphere of sugar beets and they appeared at a certain time in the year and as a response to triggers, which were likely the exudates. So do you have any thoughts of how to determine fitness costs under conditions where we do not have this massive growth? So I've done, I measured fitness in soil and we can still see fitness costs in soil. So we can take these bacteria, put them in soil. Again, we see the fitness costs. Um, I, there are experiments ongoing as, I'm, as far as I'm aware to actually test it in the sugar beet rhizosphere sphere as well. I think, um, uh, Mike might be doing some, might have some results on that. I don't want to give mm -hmm. anything away. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's definitely something we're interested in trying to understand. Yeah. But do you see growth uh, in the rhizosphere? Because I think this is a tricky thing. Uh, I typically, when we introduced uh, plasmid free and plasmid containing strain into the rhizosphere and followed this, uh, we are not seeing growth, we are seeing a slight decline. Mm -hmm. And we determined then the proportion of plasmid carrying and plasmid free uh, populations. This was for Acinetobacter. But uh, I always got the criticism you do not have growth. But uh, this is a complicated point. Mm. I mean, I mean, microbes are growing in their natural <laughs> habitats, right? So <laughs> um, there is growth in those kinds of environments. Um, I mean, I actually think that some of these plasmid fitness costs, in our case, actually comes from cells being killed mm -hmm. rather than a burden on replication. Mm -hmm. So we would probably see that happening. Again, I, I skipped over the details, but if you read the paper, we actually show that some of the genes which are upregulated actually have a, a cost by themselves because they're these hole-in genes which make holes in the cell membrane. And mm -hmm. so it could be that... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually saw a fitness cost even without any growth, because mm -hmm. just, just from cells being killed by inappropriate activation of the SOS response. Mm. Thanks. Okay, we have to move ahead. 